Well, we are uh, this morning continuing our series, as Sylvia said, on Isaiah 61, which is entitled The Season of Favour. And we are looking at four different talks, if we can have the slide up there. Uh, The Divine Plan, The Message of Favour, The Anointed Messengers, and The Restoration of the Ruined. Last week, we kicked off with The Divine Plan. We saw that we're in challenging times, uncertain, insecure times, but that in the midst of it all, there's a king on the throne. In the midst of all the brokenness that's giving rise to all that turbulence at this time, there is a king on the throne, and that king on the throne has a plan, and right at the heart of his plan there's a desire and a provision to fix the brokenness of mankind, to fix our personal brokenness, and to fix the brokenness within this world. This week, the title of the message is The Message of Favour. So we'll read from Isaiah 61, we'll just read from the first three verses, because these are the ones I'm preaching from this morning. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me, look where the word proclaim comes, anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion to to dispo on them, or even to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. So this morning, as we look... At the message of favour, I want to share just three things with you. I want to share, first of all, about understanding God's favour. We need to understand the favour of God. What is that like? I then want to talk, secondly, about what it means to live under God's favour. And then, finally, I want to talk about proclaiming this message of favour. So, hopefully, a fairly simple message this morning. So, let's look at the issue of Firstly, of understanding God's favour. What does it mean to be shown favour? Well, I want to suggest to you this morning that we really only recognise favour if we know what is and isn't coming our way on the basis of merit, on the basis of what we've done, on the basis of what we deserve. So if I worked for you for a week and you paid me wages for that time I'd worked for you that week, you wouldn't be doing me a favour giving me my wages. That would be what I was due. If I was picking up uh, your kids on Tuesday and Thursday, and you picked our kids up on Wednesday and Friday, you wouldn't be doing us a favour. That would be a reciprocal arrangement. You know, what one would expect, what one was due. If I picked your kids up, for two days each week, and you said, no, I'm not interested in helping you out, well, you know, that wouldn't go down very well. Favour, on the other hand, is an expression of generosity and blessing that you've not earned, uh, that you don't deserve. So over the last couple of weeks, I've been shown huge mercy and favour, as Linda, who has been completely immobile, uh, I've been shown huge mercy and favour by a number of women in the church who have cooked meals for us, and over the two weeks, I've not had to cook at all. That, I want to tell you, has been the most amazing expression of the favour of God. I don't, I don't think we got your crumble. That's my only... Uh, <laughs> it was a nice pudding, but it wasn't your crumble. But I've got some gaps next week. If uh... <laughs> So understanding what we do and don't deserve is important in understanding and recognizing favor. Isaiah 61, verse 2, 1 and 2 that we, we read this morning, there, uh, the Holy Spirit is anointing us and upon us to proclaim four things. 
to proclaim good news, to proclaim freedom and release for the captives and the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. But if you notice in the verse that we read today, it's also to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. Now, we always forget that, but that's in the verse there. Who knows that we live in a culture that's very comfortable with you talking about a God of love, a God who will love you, who wants to be with you and strengthen you and help you and make life better for you. Our culture is very comfortable. Talk to them about a God of love, whether they're believers or not believers, they'll be comfortable with that. But the moment you start speaking about a God of judgment, now they're offended. Now they're uncomfortable. Especially if you talk about a God of judgment who's going to judge us and may send people to hell. Now that is very uncomfortable. But a God of love, without a God of judgment, is the God of people's wishful thinking. He's actually the God, that's the God of people's imagination. That's them wanting God in their own image, just a better form and version of themselves. That's not the God of the Bible. Let's read Matthew 5, verses 21 to 22. These are the words of Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount. You know that great sermon where he speaks all those great, nice things, and then he says... In 5 verse 21, you've heard that it was said to the people long ago. This is Jesus speaking. He said, you shall not murder and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or a sister, raka, which was a term of contempt, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says you fool will be in danger of the fire of hell. 5 verses 27 to 30. You have heard that it was said, Jesus went on to say, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole, your whole body to go to hell. Our culture wants judgment. It cries out for judgment. It sees it as a sense of righteousness and justice. So, Everyone wants to see Putin accountable and put on trial for the murder of innocent civilians and others alongside him as well. There's a great sense of we want justice and judgment in this situation. There's a sense of wanting justice and judgment for the killer of Olivia Pratt. And rightly so. But our culture does not want a God of judgment. Especially if it's judging me. Especially if it's judging me for my attitude and my anger and my hateful words and speech or my lustful thoughts or the way that I live morally or sexually. We don't want a God of judgment that judges those things. But God is a God of love and he's also a God of judgment. And Jesus made that absolutely clear. And if we just want a God of love without judgment, then you've not got the God of the Bible. In fact, the day of vengeance of our God is a real day. Did you know that? The day of vengeance of our God, the day of judgment that is being spoken about here is a real day. Let's read about that in Revelation 6, verse 15 to 18. By the way, we will be lifting at some point from this low place this morning. (laughs) Hey, but listen, there are things at work in us 
to do with comfort, that are to do with what our society and culture that we're immersed in wants. And if we don't understand the God of the Bible is a God of judgment and a God of love, we actually won't understand the favor that's been shown to us. And that's what I'm going to come and unpack to you. But here's what it says about the day of vengeance of our God, the day of judgment. It says, when Christ comes again, then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich and the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains, they called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath, from the anger and the judgment of the Lamb, that is Jesus, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can withstand it? That's the day of judgment that's being proclaimed in Isaiah 61. That's the day of judgment Jesus talked about, and that's the day of judgment that's in the Bible and that we've read just there in Revelation. But if we don't understand the judgment we deserve, we won't understand the true nature and depth of the favor we've been shown. I'll say that again. If we don't understand the judgment we deserve, we won't understand the nature and the depth of the favor we've been shown. Because this favor of God didn't dismiss judgment and say, oh, it's okay. Don't worry about those things that you've done. It's fine. I'll just forget about it. He didn't just dismiss judgment. The Bible tells us that God, through Jesus, fulfilled that judgment. And he fulfilled it by placing the punishment that should have rightly been ours on Jesus. And the result of that, the result of what God has done, that favor he's expressed from us, is that we have been absolutely radically transformed In every way, we've been transformed in our position before God. We've been transformed in our nature before God. And we've been transformed in our standing before God. You know, the favor of God, Ephesians 2 verse 3, that the favor of God tells me this. Ephesians 2 verse 3 tells us this. You and I were by nature objects of God's wrath. By our very nature and our very being, our godlessness, our wrongdoing, our self-centeredness, everything. We were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love and his great grace and his great mercy and his favor, we have been moved from being objects of his judgment and anger. Now we're completely different. Oh, guess what now? Now we're objects and we're standing totally under his grace and his mercy and his favor. The favor of God means, according to Romans 5 verse 10 and Colossians 1 21, that once we were enemies of God because of how we lived. But now, because of his great favor, we have become friends of God. We were once, Ephesians 2.13 tells us, far from God. But because of his favor into our lives, we've been brought near to God. Colossians 1.13 says we were once in the kingdom of darkness in the way that we lived. But now, because of his favor and his grace, we're now part of the kingdom of the Son that he loves. We were once, 1 Peter 2 verse 10, it says we were not a people. We were our own people. But now... Because of the favor of God, we're the people of God. The spirit within us cries, Abba, Father, Daddy. What an amazing, incredible transformation. So this message of favor is not, hey folks, this this favor of God gives us a a bit of a better life. Because you can choose to have life without God, or you can choose to have life with God. So this message of favor is not, hey, come to God and he gives you a bit of a better life. This message of favor is not somehow, well, we were in a, a neutral sort of place and now we can have God involved and it's a bit more positive life. That's not the message of favor that's being proclaimed in Isaiah 61. 
This message of favour tells us that we were taken from a disastrously negative place where the judgment of God was coming on us and what a day that was going to be that we were moved from a disastrously negative place to an unbelievably, unimaginable, positive place in and through Jesus Christ. I really hate it when a weak gospel is proclaimed that says, come to Jesus and have a bit of a better life. I think, no, that is not the gospel. The gospel is much more than that. It's more radical than that. It's more transforming than that. We've been moved from this disastrously negative place to this unimaginable positive place. And it's all by grace, not by merit. It's all an unbelievable expression of favor. The favor Isaiah 61 is talking about, proclaiming, is only understood in the context of a God of love and a God of judgment. It's only understood the favor of God in the context of a day of vengeance and judgment that's come in everyone's way. It's only understood the Isaiah, the favor, message of favor in Isaiah 61 when the, we understand the true depth of kindness we've received in the context of the judgment we totally deserved. And if you don't think you deserved it, you haven't really had revelation about being a sinner and how abhorrent that is to God. But this is a message of grace and favor. My goodness. Has it moved us and transformed us in our standing before God? Let's talk secondly about living under God's favor. If we receive this message of grace and favor into our lives personally, and we continue to abide in Christ, it's not a moment of favor that we receive. Actually, it's not even a year of favor that you receive. It's a lifetime of favor. It's daily favor. You know, there's a big difference between living under someone's favor and not living under their favor. I came face to face with this in some big way in 1984. I just qualified, 23 years of age, as a junior doctor working in Withenshaw Hospital in Manchester. And my first job as a medical house officer, was as house officer to Dr. P.E. Jones. Well, Dr. P.E. Jones was a miserable consultant. <laughs> I really hope he's not watching this. Uh, I don't want any of you getting any uh, sort of naughty ideas and trying to contact him and give him some sort of link here. But he was, he was a pretty miserable sort of guy. I want to tell you, I had an absolutely miserable first three months working for him. I could not do anything right. I mean, everything was wrong. I mean, I absolutely dreaded the wall drowns. Because if I didn't have everything in place, and all the results back that should be back, I would be shouted at in front of patients, in front of the other staff, the nurses and everyone. It was a miserable moment. So that's what it felt like not to be under favour. There was no favour. There wasn't any itsy bits, little bit of favour he had towards me. It was a miserable time. And, and then I diagnosed something in a patient that he had missed. <laughs> oh yes. I spotted some things on the x-ray and diagnosed some things. He had missed them. And that was it. The next three months, I was under favor. <laughs> My goodness, I want to tell you, I was the golden boy. <laughs> I couldn't do anything wrong. Nothing wrong at all. You know, in fact, I didn't even bother getting the results for the wall traps. <laughs> no, no, I did. <laughs> I was nothing. He invited me. He had me several times around to his house. Over the years, he followed my career. He wrote fantastic letters of reference for me. And I lived those last three months under his favor. And it was just totally different from not being under his favor. Well, do you know something? So it is with God. 
I don't think God's quite as miserable as... uh... (laughs) But so it is with God. To live under the favor of God, to live under the favor of God, is to live with him predisposed to bless you, to protect you, to provide for you, to work in you and through you. Predisposed, he's totally predisposed to those things towards you. In fact, Jesus' constant reminder to us was that God, God's posture to us when we come into his favor, that his posture of favor to us is as a father with his children. Now, I'm a father and I'm a grandfather and my children and grandchildren, I want to tell you, they live under my favor. Listen, I love everyone in this church. I do. But my favorite people... The youngest daughter. Yeah. Is my eldest daughter, Hannah. (laughs) There you go, Hannah. (laughs) But, you know, they live under under my favor. I'm totally predisposed towards them. If I take the grandchildren into a busy playground and the the kids are running about and playing on things, I don't have my eye on other children in the playground. I only have my attention and eyes on one set of people, and it's my grandkids. There's only one set of people I follow around the playground. It's my grandkids. My attention is fully, I'm fully devoted, fully with them to make sure they're okay, to make sure nothing wrong happens, to make sure they enjoy the time and have a fun time. And I'm constantly looking, as is Linda, with our children and our grandchildren to be supportive, encouraging, to give practical support, spiritual support, to make provision where we can, to be generous where we can, to do and to give anything we can possibly do and give to enrich and bless their lives. And Jesus said this in Matthew 7, verse 11. Jesus said this in Matthew... (laughs) I told him at the beginning, I said, you can't fall asleep in my sermon. It's Ethan. He said, though, it's going to be hard not to fall asleep in your sermon. I thought that was a bit cheeky, but there we go. But this is what Jesus said. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? How we posture ourselves, how myself and Linda, how you... Posture yourselves with favor towards your children and your grandchildren is a pale, pale reflection of how postured and positive and predisposed God the Father is to you and to me. When we look at how we are postured with favor to our children and grandchildren, You understand, when you look at that and see that, that is a how much more situation. There are several of those situations in the Bible. How much more? See, just gives you a little window and a little picture, right? And then it goes, how much more? Not a little bit more. Not a lot more. Not significantly more. Outrageously more. Do you know, to God, you're not one of many. You're one of a kind. Some of you need to hear that. You're not part of a crowd to God. You're not one of many. You're one of a kind. Because you're not just a child by creation. You're a child by adoption. You understand the difference? Everyone's a child by the fact that God gave everyone life. But you're a child by adoption. You know what adoption has to do with with God? It has to do with the fact he chose you. Psalm 17 verse 8 says you're the apple of God's eye. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says the eyes of God are constantly upon you so that when you need strength, he'll strengthen you. Psalm 33, verses 18 and 19 says the eyes of the Lord are constantly on you just like My eyes are on our grandkids in the playground. The eyes of the Lord are constantly on you to deliver you from death and to keep you alive in famine. And if you want a New Testament verse that sums up how special and favoured you are to God, 
then let's read 1 Peter 2 verses 9 and 10. Which says, yes, tried to take it off, didn't he? It says, but you, can, can you put your hand up if you're one of the you? There's a few of you not with your hands up. <laughs> Come and see me afterwards. <laughs> but you, not the person next to you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you'd not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Living under God's favour doesn't mean we never have challenges, troubles, struggles or suffering. Jesus didn't promise that. Read your Bible. He didn't have that, but God's favour was on him. It doesn't mean the absence of those things, but he did promise as an expression of his favour, things like Romans 8, 28, to work all things together for the good of those who love him and whose favour he... Um, those on whom his favour rests. He did promise to keep watch over us, to keep his eye on us, to be with us, to protect us, to provide for us and to faithfully sustain us at all times with his love and grace. And I want to tell you, I've been a Christian 1980. How long have I been a Christian? Um, 1980, 42 years I've been a Christian, right? I have journaled most days over that 42 years. Journal, write down, wrote things that are going on in my life and things God's saying and what I'm praying and all that sort of thing. 42 years of journaling. I got a lot of journals. <laughs> you know, now it's all digital, of course. It's all online. I have loads of books. I want to tell you. Those journals are filled with countless, countless examples of God supernaturally providing for me and for us and for those I've been praying for, rescuing us, Comforting us, strengthening us, protecting us, sustaining, enriching and blessing. Countless examples. My books are full of just countless examples. Even this week is full of countless examples of God's favour touching my life and the lives that I, of those I lift before him. Which leaves me totally confident. I'm totally confident. I'm confident. Big, 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 big. <laughs> we'll try that again. I'm confident biblically. But I'm also confident on, the base, confident on the basis of experience. I'm not in the periphery of God's attention and vision. I'm right at the center. I'm not at the back of God's mind and thoughts. I'm right at the forefront of his thoughts. I'm the apple of his eye. I'm his most precious possession. I was saved as a wonderful expression of his favour and I live daily in an ongoing way right in the centre of that favour. And so do you. So do you. If you don't understand that, if you don't need that, we need to pray with you. Because if you don't believe that and know that, you're out of line with what God says. You're out of line with his word. Now, I understand, you know, we can go through experiences and we can wonder and we question, sure. But I tell you, God's favor is on you. His eyes are on you. His heart is thoroughly towards you. And he's predisposed to work out everything ultimately for your blessing and for your good and for the glory of Amen. his name. It's a wonderful thing to live under God's favour. Thank you, Jesus. To be saved by that favour. To be saved from judgment. To be saved from the day of vengeance. And to be totally transformed by that favour in our nature, position and standing with God. From being objects of wrath, anger and judgment. To being his most precious possession, the apple of his eye. And thereafter, to live daily in his favour. Not randomly subject to chances, the, the events and chances of life, 
we're subject to his favour and subject to his grace until the day we die when that same favour and grace will bring us eternally into his presence. Wonderful. What a wonderful message of favour we've come into and what a wonderful message of favour we have to share with others. So let's finally finish with the issue of proclaiming a message of favour. This message of favour, as I've said to you before, is not a message about improving your life. It's sort of some religious self-help package. It's a message of two stark alternatives. Come and live under the favour of God or stay under the judgment and anger of God. Now, I'm not suggesting that we put on a placard, you know, with written on the front, the end is nigh, and on the back, repent, or you're going to hell. I need to laugh a bit more on that, because I'm really, I'm not serious about going out with a placard. It is a joke. I'm not suggesting, that's not the way. The Bible tells us the kindness of God. People need to see the kindness of God is what leads people to repentance. But the temptation in a culture which only wants to engage with a God of love and is offended by a God of judgment is to avoid the issue of sin and wrongdoing. To steer well away from a God who will judge every sin. And definitely to steer away from a day of vengeance and a prospect of hell. And of course we live in a culture where the church is increasingly unwilling and embarrassed to define sin, to talk about sin, to suggest God will judge sin, and to talk about hell as an eternal consequence of our sin. But Jesus, in proclaiming the year of the Lord's favour, because of course Isaiah 61 does apply to us, but it first and foremost applied to Jesus. But Jesus, coming in the power of the Spirit, anointed by God, to preach good news, proclaim this year of favour. He talked about all those things. He talked about judgment. He talked about hell. He talked about sin. He talked about all of those things because he understood people needed to know the reality of what was coming their way. He knew that people needed to know what the inevitability of their sin was in order to truly understand the nature of God's grace and favour to them. And of course, in Matthew chapter 1, when the angel appears in a a dream to Joseph, he says to Joseph, you know, Mary's about to give birth to a son, and when he's born, you're to give him the name Jesus. And Jesus, of course, as you know, means he saves. And the angel goes on to say, because he will save people from their sins is what it says. In other words, call him Jesus because right at the heart of who he is and how he's living and how he will die and how he will be raised, right at the heart of that is a desire and a plan to save people. To save people from what? To save people from the primary root of their brokenness, which is sin in our lives. And so he said, because he will save people from his sins, from the judgment coming on those sins, and from the eternal consequences of those sins. And if you strip sin and judgment, or a day of vengeance, out of the gospel, I want to ask you this question. What exactly are people being saved from? What are people being saved from? Are they being saved just from a, a lesser life to a better life? If you strip sin and judgment and a day of vengeance out of the gospel. By the way, I'm not suggesting that every time you talk to someone about the gospel, you've got to give it everything, whole package. But we can't do what much of the church is doing in here, in this nation. And a lot of the church is being shaped by the culture and, 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 and what the culture does and doesn't want. And it doesn't want a God of judgment. It just wants a God of love. But we mustn't come under that. We must be thoroughly biblical and we must give a true gospel sound that ultimately will enable people to understand just the amazing depth and richness and transforming power that the gospel can have in their lives. 
If we're to line up with a message of favor of, in Isaiah 61, we have to proclaim a holistic gospel, good news, freedom, release, favor in the context of God's anger and judgment on our sin, on our sin personally, on people's sin, and the coming day of vengeance. And of course, this is not a heartless choice that God offers, is it? He doesn't sort of come and say, okay, one or two options, day of vengeance, day of favor. You know, choose which one you want, A or B, and live with the consequences. No, God doesn't come to us like that, not at all. God comes to people with passionate appeal. Judgment is coming, but that is not what he wants for people. In fact, 2 Peter 3 verse 9 tells us that God is patiently holding off the return of Jesus because he's not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to come under that judgment. He doesn't want anyone to be amongst that group of people that on the day of his judgment asks the, the rocks and the mountains to fall on them and hide them from the face of Jesus. He doesn't want that. He wants for people to be able to stand on that day of judgment, look at Jesus and say, this is great. Now we're moving into eternal favor. We've had a foretaste on the earth of what the favor of God is like and now we're going to live in eternal favor and eternal in his presence. He wants that for every single person on earth. He even wants that for Putin. Oh, surely not. Oh, yes, he does. Because when the Bible says he doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, that means he doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants everyone to come to repentance. I'm not saying I'm full of faith for Putin to come to repentance. God is passionate in his appeal. There's a day of judgment coming, but he wants people to enter in the, to the year and the day of favor. It's a, a passionately appeals. He sent Jesus to implement this plan at great cost to them both. And so the messengers, I want to suggest to you, that you and I that carry out this message of, carry forth this message of favor should be passionate. Yesterday was the three-year uh, anniversary of my father's death. Uh, for thir I, I was passionate the whole of my life that my dad would come, come into the favor of God and experience this life living under God's favor. That's why I prayed for him almost daily for 39 and a half years and took almost every opportunity I could to share Jesus with him. But he never, as you know, he never responded over that time. And... And then as it came, drew towards the end, and I knew, well, he wasn't going to live most of his life in the favor of God, I, you know, I just, I said, I don't want my father to, to face your judgment. I don't want him to face you on the day of vengeance. In the 39 and a half years I prayed for my father and shared with my father and demonstrated Christ to him, I, I, I was never half-hearted. I was always passionate. Because there was so much at stake. I really pray. I really pray that we will understand how much is at stake. I pray that we will carry the heart and the passion and the love of God for those in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, those that, in our families that don't know Christ. And don't somehow, somehow come to a place where we think, well, you know what, they don't know the Lord. They would have a better life if they did, but you know, what can you do? We can't do that. There's a day of vengeance coming. Jesus came to save people from that day, from judgment and from their sins. And he came that they might actually have the complete opposite of that experience. And I want to thank you right now, Jesus, that, that all of us here can live in that. And I want to pray you will stir us about this wonderful message of favor you have brought us into and entrusted to us to share with others and I pray that at no point in our lives would we ever be half-hearted in our passion to see others discover just how much you love them we pray that in Jesus name amen would the band come back up please and we're they're gonna we're gonna take communion I just thought the the communion was due to come before the message this morning but by the time I finished this I thought well Maybe God will just have touched your heart to just remind you just how much favor you're living under.
maybe afresh this morning, you will feel that and know that. And what a wonderful place to share communion together from. Amen? Pray.